higher one. Uh, just so you know, I got two really big spotlights. I can't see any of you. So uh, I, I won't see how you react to this presentation. So I'll just assume that you like everything I'm talking about. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eric Hellman. Uh, I'm from Sweden. I'm an Android developer, freelancing there. Uh, I'm also a developer expert and uh, have been doing Android basically since the beginning. I'm going to talk about processing camera input on Android because that is something that I've been struggling with basically since the start of Android. Hopefully, this presentation will help you uh, or give you some tips and tricks uh, on how to deal with it. Uh, so, but let's first see what's, what is it really we're going to talk about, because I'm saying processing camera input, it might mean different things to you people here, and I'm going to try to narrow it down. Uh, so the agenda for today is basically this. You have an app. With that app, you use a camera to scan something. Uh, or to analyze uh, images that the camera sees. And you take that input and you process it in your application. It might be a, as simple as scanning a barcode or a QR code, recognizing text on a paper, or doing something really advanced with some uh, machine learning stuff. So regardless of what it is, uh, this basically fits into what I'm calling camera processing. Uh, and as you, you probably see here, this is an iPhone. This is not an Android phone on this picture because the first couple of stock images I found to illustrate this was all iPhones, which kind of illustrates how hard this is on Android, I think. So yeah, it is difficult. Anyone worked on the camera on Android know this. So first, let's talk about the different APIs we have in order to communicate with Android. Uh, sorry, <laughs> with, with a camera on Android. And first of all, we have the good old legacy camera API, Android hardware camera. It was the only way to use a camera up until Lollipop. And it still is something that a lot of developers fall back on. Uh, but it's kind of considered a legacy today. So with Lollipop came the Camera 2 API. You find that in the Camera 2 package under Android hardware. It's a very, very competent API, also extremely complicated to use. Anyone here try using it? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I can't see. Uh, anyone used it know that it's a lot of struggle just to do the bare minimum thing you want to do. So neither of these two was very useful for the most common use cases of just scanning preview frames. If you're going to write on camera application, yeah, the camera too is great. Uh, but if you wanted to do some simple, quick processing, it was hard. And there's, it's hard because of different reasons, and we're going to go through this. So at Google I.O. this year, uh, Google announced what's called Camera X. Uh, Camera X is a um, Jetpack library, so it's standalone. It tries to normalize uh, the Camera 2 APIs. It's, it's supported from Lollipop and forward. And it kind of makes it much simpler to do these most common use cases. You can use it both for camera analysis operations, which we're going to talk about today. But you can also write fully fledged camera applications with advanced features and such. But I'm not going to go into that. So if you're interested in the more advanced stuff in CameraX regarding photography, I recommend you go and look at the Google I.O. Uh, videos on this and read up on the documentation. We're going to focus on the part which belongs to uh, image analysis. So these two, the camera, the legacy camera API and the camera two, are not covered at all in this presentation. So camera is basic, the camera part is basically just how to get the image out that we want to process. The other part is doing computer vision, which is a more generic term about ana analyzing images. And there is a lot of different options here on Android. Uh, I'm just covering some of them uh, in this slide here. The first one is MLKit, and this is what we're going to focus more about. Though. But others is Zebra Crossing. Uh, you have probably used this if you have ever implemented a barcode scanning before Camera X. Uh, so it's been around for a long while. It's kind of the de facto uh, implementation on all platforms for uh, scanning barcodes and QR codes. OpenCV is the industry standard for computer vision processing. 
you can use this library on Android. It exists, it exists on all possible platforms. Uh, but it's extremely complicated and heavy to use. It will result in a huge binary uh, load on your APK. Um, but it's there. You can, you can do pretty much anything within the domain of computer vision here. OpenGL is another option. Basically, you pass in the image into a texture, and you process it using uh, shaders. That is complicated also for various reasons. Uh, and there is also the, the, the alternative on Android, which is called RenderScript, which is a, probably a better option instead of OpenGL ES. And then finally, uh, we have the good old Play Services Vision API, which you might have used, which existed uh, up until uh, Firebase ML Kit came out. Uh, now, Zebra Crossing and Play Service Vision API, you should consider deprecated. Don't use this anymore. You don't need to. It, uh, everything we, I'm going to talk about today can be done with MLKit. So the candidates we have left uh, for, using, for doing stuff on Android are these. And uh, well, I excluded the other three due to complexity. OpenCV, extremely heavy. You probably don't need to use that unless you're doing some really, really advanced computer vision, in which case you can probably come up and do this presentation instead. Uh, OpenGL, yes, you don't need that. You can use RenderScript instead, but as I'm going to talk about today, it's probably not what you want to do if you want to do most of the camera processing. You're going to see why in a, later in the presentation. So computer vision on Android is CameraX plus MLKit today. This is what you should focus on if you're going to implement anything from simple barcode scanning to really advanced machine learning, la image labeling, these are the two uh, things you should combine. The nice thing here is that while Camera X makes it easy to use camera on Android, MLKit also works on iOS, which is another reason why you probably would like to use MLKit for all your image processing. So, <clears throat> sorry. Now, I'm going to start with let's get started quickly. So for those of you who have to run out here in five minutes, we're going to cover this. But you won't get the nice parts. You will just get the quick and easy startup. So you start by setting up a Firebase project, because we're going to use MLKit, which is part of Firebase. You, I assume most of you have done this at some time. But it's super simple to do. You get this dialog. You just fill in the package name. You regi register everything. And then you get the JSON file you include in your project. And you're done. That's the Firebase setup part there. You add the dependencies. And we have the Camera X dependencies. And we have the Firebase ML Vision de uh, dependencies. Now, now comes Camera X part. We're going to set up the preview. This is what we display to the user. This is not what's going to do the analyzing. You start by doing this by creating a preview config. In this case, we make it simple for us. We just tell us tell which camera we want to use. We want to use the one on the back. Then we create an instance of a preview, uh, preview class. We pass the configuration into it. Then we fetch the viewfinder view. What I'm calling viewfinder. We're going to talk more about the viewfinder in a moment. The viewfinder with camera X is always a texture view. Uh, I say that with a bit of a reservation. You can use other things, but you shouldn't. Texture view is what you want here. You fetch that one, and then you call set on preview output update listeners. Uh, and that one will call, you get your callback once uh, when the previews are ready to be displayed. And the only thing you do is you call viewfinder.surface texture. You take the surface texture of the texture view and assign it to the surface texture of the preview output. Finally, you call CameraX.bind to lifecycle. This will handle the teardown and releasing of resources, which is necessary, which is otherwise a rather complicated operation. This here in, let me see here, this here, is, of course, your lifecycle aware components, so your fragment or your activity. Now you got that one set up, you will be dis displaying preview frames in your application. Uh, now you want to set up MLKit to 
to scan barcodes, and the code looks like this. You create an options, which you configure the barcode scanning things, and you get the vision barcode detector from Firebase, from the Firebase Vision API. That's it. And now we're going to connect these two. So going to kind of connect uh, Camera X with Firebase Vision. So we create an image analysis, and it works almost like the same way as we do with creating a preview. So we create a config, and the config parameters here, we're going to go through them in details later. But here we say that we always want the latest image. So we, don't, we don't want to process all the images, because your processing will probably not be in the same frame rate as a camera. The camera has a frame rate of 30 frames per second, maybe more. Uh, and you might not be able to process images that fast. So you want to tell Camera X to discard old images and just give you the latest all the time. You give it a target resolution. This is what you would like to have. Now, for scanning barcodes, this is actually too big. You can probably scale it down even smaller. You create this, uh, this config object. You create an image ana analysis object with this configuration. And you set the analyzer. The analyzer is a callback function uh, which has two parameters when it's invoked. The image, the actual preview image in that case, and the rotation of that image. Finally, you call bind to lifecycle. Now, this bind to lifecycle, you can call that many times in a fragment or an activity, and it will bind the new things that you, you assign it. So you don't need to bind both the preview and the analysis at the same time, which is convenient, actually. OK, so the analysis operation, how, to, how we connect this in the, in the end, looks like this. We first convert the rotation of the image, which is in degrees, to a constant in the Firebase Vision API. We're going to look at that, op that function a little bit later. It's super simple, so I'm skipping it for now. And then we take the image, and the first par uh, image parameter here in Camera X is actually a proxy class for a regular Android media image class. And these can both be null, so you have to deal with that. And unless these are null, we convert the media image into a vision image. And then we call detect image using the Firebase Vision API. And you have a task, a regular Firebase task, uh, which you can add a success listener and stuff like that. And then we have the bar, you, you get the barcodes, and you can, it's a list of results, basically. <coughs> Sorry. So this is a quick and easy setup. You can do this in a few minutes, and it will work. But it will probably look weird, especially in the preview, the viewfinder. So anyone here have worked with camera and displaying the, displaying the preview frames in the viewfinder? The viewfinder is that thing. In a regular camera, that's what we see there. And you have probably done this if you work with a camera and you see that everything gets skewed. So if I would have done all the codes from before, and what you see on yeah, the right is the result of that in the viewfinder, how, how that image would look like. Now, if I take the regular Android camera application and take a picture with that one, or take a screenshot, actually, I get a much more uh, correct image. So the one on the right is stretched weirdly. That is a common case in applications that do barcode scanning or text scanning and stuff like that. You probably have seen that before, and you struggle with it. And you get it kind of right, and you're, you're happy with it, and you leave it at that. But this is annoying to users. It looks weird. And getting this right is not as easy as it is. There is lots of code samples out there for how to do this. I'm going to try to give you a super simple a uh, snippet of code that you can use for this that kind of covers all the cases. You have to think about it a little bit how you write it yourself, but hopefully this will help. I have talked to uh, the Camera X team at Google, and they are thinking about creating a nice utility function that is similar to this. OK, but let's look at how it looks like, really. Uh, well, first, we look at the, uh, the text view itself here. So you have a text view that displays the viewfinder, simple text view. It's a constraint layout uh, as a parent. So what we do here is we say that we want the aspect ratio of this one to be 16 by 9, like widescreen, sort of. Now, 
in Android, all the camera preview frames are usually, and I say usually, are usually four by three instead. So they have a different aspect ratio. It doesn't really matter what aspect ratio they have. You probably will run into the same problem regardless. Now, if you haven't done this before, you think, but, ah, yeah, it's cool. I just scale this one so it matches 16 by 9 instead. It's, that's easy. Well, we're going to see that. So this is what it looks like live. And as you can see, the rectangles on this tablecloth that I have here, they, don't, uh, they, they become rectangles. They are actually square. They, shouldn't be, they should be square, not rectangles. And especially visible if you twist this one, you see they stretch weirdly. This is a common effect. And I told you that the camera preview frames on Android are 4 by 3. So what if I change my, my uh, viewfinder to 4 by 3 instead? Well, look at that. It looks better, right? But not perfect. It's still a little bit weird. Now, the correct way what, how this should look like is as this. You see, there's no stretching happen, not even in the edges. Just to show you one more time, I will go back to the previous one. You see, even this, this one is 4 by 3 and still gets stretched, especially in the edges. And this one, 4 by 3, no stretching happening. Now, OK, so I have to have my viewfinder in 4 by 3 and I have to do something more. No, that's actually wrong. You should be able to have a viewfinder of whatever size you want, what suits best for your application. If it's 16 by 9, 4 by 3, 2 by 3, whatever. The aspect ratio is, should, be, should be possible to use whatever. Um, because, like, for instance, if you want to have uh, an application that you scan a single line of text, you might just want to have a very thin viewfinder up there to indicate the user that just scan a single line of text here. You should be able to do that. So this is weird, maybe, but it still looks correct. It doesn't get skewed anywhere. Now, OK, but why haven't Google done this for us? Well, they actually have a sample for how to transform the texture in the texture, in the texture view. That kind of works, but there is one problem with it. But the code looks like this. I won't go into the details, but you, you, get, you create a matrix, uh, a 3 by 3 matrix. Uh, you find the center of your viewfinder, and you calculate the buffer ratio uh, for the, of the preview, and then you create the scaled height, and then you, create, you define the x scaling and the y scaling, and you call matrix.prescale, so that it scales from the middle here. This one works fine, but the result is this. It doesn't fill up the entire view it gets scaled down so that it actually fits inside the view. And that's usually not what we want. We don't want those white borders on the side. We want it to take up the entire view we have there. So this is a little bit sad, because the, the Google sample is otherwise it's, it's nice to look at. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, luckily, here's the code. And it's very simple-ish. So we start with a matrix. We find the center of the viewfinder. We calculate the ratio of the previews, the, the actual frames that come from the camera. Take the width divided by the height. Then we do the same with the viewfinder. And then we scale it like this. We assume now that the, the viewfinder view is wider than it's tall. OK? If it's the opposite, if it's taller than it's wide, you have to flip this around. Now, the key here is this here, viewfinder ratio multiplied by preview ratio. That is the key to getting this right. So what it does is basically it scales it up so it fills the entire view and also crops it, basically. So the, view, uh, the previews will be, you won't get the entire previews, but it will fill up the entire view for you without getting skewed. So there is cropping happening here. Now, OK, I could talk about this one for uh, an entire hour. It's a rather complicated matter. Uh, so the result will be like this. Uh, so it actually works. And I wrote a blog post, which I published yesterday, on this topic. Uh, you can find it at this address. 
where you can read more about it. It's about a 10 minute read. Uh, so you could uh, go into more of the details of why this is and how you deal with it and how you should think about it. I recommend all of you to write this code yourself because writing a common function that covers all the cases, I don't really feel up to that and you shouldn't have to do that yourself. So please read this uh, blog post if you want to go into details on this. The next part is YUV, uh, or the color coding YUV. So there is a little bit of history here. This is the image format for the preview frames that you're getting. It's also the default image format for, uh, camera, camera, for the camera on Android. So YUV is a color encoding uh, scheme. And uh, it actually is several different color coding schemes. And the history is kind of interesting. It goes back to the days when we had black and white TVs and when color TVs were introduced. So the image on the black and white TVs was, trans was transmitted on a single sing signal, telling how bright each pixel were. Now, when they added color, when color TVs came, uh, they needed a way to also transmit color information that wouldn't break black and white TVs, because a lot of people still had the black and white TVs. So what they did is they kept this black and white signal, and they added the, the color information as two new signals on this one. That is the reason why this is, exists, and it's been around since back, back since the color TVs were introduced. Uh, the formats are a little bit different these days, of course. They're, first of all, they're digital, not analog. But the principle is the same. So to illustrate what it looks like, it's this. So the image on the far right there is the complete image. The second part is the, the black and white information, or basically the intensity of the light. How bright should this pixel be? And the second two are the color information. So this is not your typical RGB thing. So YUV here means like the Y channel is the, the color intensity or the brightness, and the U and V are the planes that contain color information that is combined into the final image on the right. So Another way to visualize this is through this amazing GIF. <clears throat> Basically, you have the Y axis going down there. So at the top, you have white. And at the bottom, on the Y axis, you have black. And then uh, you see here, here it's called CR and CB, which is what the U and V uh, things are called on the Android uh, version of the YUV thing. Uh, so that one is kind of interesting to illustrate it. Now, if we would cut this plane, this cube here in the middle, you would get this plane. So this is how it looks there. Uh, so this is when y is 0 0.5 like in the middle. The encoding of this in the each pixel, uh, it, it can vary. Now, the nice thing with YUV is that uh, you have the Y channel contains the brightness of each pixel. But certain YUE schemes can uh, have subsampling so that they don't have a color information for every pixel, but they have it for every second pixel or every fourth pixel, etc. And that kind of works, and it reduces the, the image size. On Android, uh, the YUE scheme we use there, they have uh, the color information for all the pixels. So you don't have to worry. But it's kind of interesting. You see the top part of this. Uh, 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 square here is the Y information, and then you just have the U and the V information below there and taking much less space. Now, so let's say you don't want to use MLKit. You, wanna, you have to do your own image uh, analysis. So good thing here to know is that the image format is also always image format .yuv 420888 That's just the name of that format. So if you want to convert each individual pixel, this is the C++ code taken from Wikipedia. Uh, everybody remember this one now? No? OK. Don't worry, you don't have to. So you don't need to convert it from, uh, from a YV to <laughs> RGB information, because most of the time, black and white is just fine. You don't really need color information for most of the cases when it comes to image processing, which is also a reason why often if you've done image processing or computer vision before, we always convert it to black and white first. So how would you convert a YUV image to a black and white? Well, 
Super simple. We create a function which takes our image uh, and it returns a pair with a byte buffer which will contain the grayscale pixels and the size parameters telling you how big this image is. So start like that. We calculate the size or we extract the size. Uh, we extract the Y buffer, the buffer in the plane in this image containing the brightness pixels. And we, call the, we create a new buffer of the same size. Uh, this is a byte buffer. And then we place, we copy all the, all the information in the Y buffer into our gray pixels buffer. And then we flip it. This is how the byte buffers work. Uh, so that means now it's ready to be read. And then basically we return this as a pair together with the size. Voila, now you have the grayscale image that you need. Now you can do your, other, your own processing in whatever way you, you already have. A couple of gotchas with camera X. Uh, and this is, this is kind of important things to understand. So the first thing <laughs> is that camera X processing in itself must be synchronous. And this is because camera X will close the Im each image that gets passed to the analyzer. An analyzer. <laughs> Tricky word that. So this, for instance, will not work. It will crash. Uh, there is an issue for this that I have filed, and I've talked extensively with Google about this one, so they might change this so that you can do processing asynchronously. But for now, if you do your own processing and don't use MLKit, uh, you can't do something like this, unless you manually extract all the information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, you can't pass the image to a different thread. Another thing, the follow-up problem with that one is that this makes it very hard to use something like render script together with camera X, because the, the default way of passing an image to render script is by using an image writer. The image writer, when you pass an image to it, will automatically call close on your image. But so will camera X once the analyzer function is done, and then it will crash. So same issue, just a different per, uh, aspect of it. So these are two important things to remember today. Uh, that might change later. Now, another thing to think of here is how do I enable the flashlight or the torch on the back of the screen? Well, you call preview.enable torch and true, and then you enable it. Now, let's say you, have a, you, you want to do your own analyzing or you, want, you really want to analyze every single frame. So you can configure the analyzer in Camera X to do that. The way to do it is to, to set this on the config, acquire next image. This means that Camera X will retain all the images that are produced by the camera, which also means you need to tell it, OK, keep a buffer. This buffer is probably too small. Um, but we're going to use the same code in a moment uh, to display why. So you tell it, like, OK, retain this big buffer. I will process the, every single image. Don't worry about it. Now, if you don't fulfill that, if you don't manage to process every single image, Camera X will crash. Or the application will crash, rather. Yeah, not, maybe not crash so much. It's just stall sometimes. Uh, now, so why would you want to process every single image? Well, you might want to do it in parallel. Like, the analyzer function itself needs to be synchronous, but you can run multiple ones at the same time. I'm not sure why you would like to do this, but this was apparently important for Google to implement, so they did that. So the way you do that is you create an executor, you give it a fixed pool size, you guess you could give it a, a cached pool size as well. Um, and then you do the same as before. You say, it process the next image, and keep a buffer about five images. So I, that's why I used five. And then this one will run in parallel. Now, I, I'm not sure why. Maybe there are people out there who need this. But uh, yeah. So better, and the way I recommend you to use Camera X for image analysis is using acquire latest image instead. 
So this will discard all the old images, so you don't need to care about them. So if your processing isn't done, we'll simply just discard them. Now, in this case, the set image queue depth will kind of configure how long your processing can go without CameraX becoming upset. Now, so the CameraX analysis API, uh, or the CameraX itself actually, is still an alpha. So the API is still subject to change, or target to change. I hope they make some changes to this so that you, for first of all, fix the, the issue that I reported, so that CameraX doesn't close the image itself, but you will close it so that you can do processing asynchronously. That would enable us to use render script much more easier. Uh, but until that is done, you know, um, you have to be aware of these uh, limitations today. Moving on to MLKit. This is actually the simplest part of this one, and this is why I also say that use MLKit. Don't try to use OpenCV or Zebra Crossing or any other of these weird APIs that are still out there unless you absolutely have to, unless MLKit does not support the thing you want to do. So what is supported today? Um, most likely, if you're doing camera processing, you probably want to do it on device. I really don't see the point of doing cloud analysis with a continuous stream of camera frames, um, unless you have a really fast internet. Um, so yeah, so these are the things. You can find it on the Firebase uh, documentation. So the first thing, uh, it's optional, but I recommend it is to add this metadata tag to your manifest. And uh, this one here says, which kind of model in Firebase Vision is it you want to use, or the MLKit? And you can add m multiple models here. Uh, what that means is that when your application is installed, Play Services will look at your manifest. And if those models haven't been downloaded, it will download them for you at the same time, so that your first startup will be better. Now, you remember the, the function for converting from degrees to Firebase constants? This is the one. So there basically are four different degrees that your camera uh, preview frame will have. It's 0, 90, 180, and 270, basically depending on what the screen orientation is, sort of. Uh, and you need to re return these constants instead of the degrees when you pass it into Firebase uh, Vision API. Text recognition is another useful feature of this one. Uh, I imagine a lot of banking applications where you're going to pay your bills, you, there are a lot of information to scan. So if you can assist the user to do that. Also, if you're implementing payment in your application, uh, you, you want to help the user to add uh, credit card details, all of these things is where text recognition API in MLKit will be useful. So this is the code for that one. Not very complicated. Again, you have the Firebase. API for, for a success listener and a failure listener once you, do, once you process it. Um, now, the, the result can be a bit intimidating at first. So you get a bunch, uh, you get a result, and in the result, uh, you get a, a number of blocks. So that's the blocks of text. Each block of text contains a number of lines of text. Each line contains a number of elements. So you can go through this one in, down to a very detail. Or, you can just get the entire uh, result text up there. Uh, and then do some fancy regular expression, I don't know, uh, to find the whatever it is you're looking for. Um, those of you who are interested in machine learning, or if your company has a fancy machine learning uh, model for doing whatever labeling it is you want to do on the camera frames, uh, you get AutoML. An AutoML is basically you take your fancy TensorFlow uh, model, you upload it to Firebase, and it, it's gonna, it, it will automatically download to the device, and you can call it from Firebase to label your images. And the way to do this is like this. You add these dependencies. You already had the, Fire, the Firebase ML Vision dependency, so you just add, add the AutoML uh, as well. You start by configuring the Firebase hosted model. Uh, you create the conditions for how it should be downloaded. If it's a big model, maybe you want to limit it to, to Wi-Fi. Uh, and you tell it when to download and stuff like that. Uh, and then you register your model. 
Uh, now, you want to actually tell it to download, so make sure that it is downloaded before you start your processing or your labeling. So download remote model if needed. That's a good thing to do. So then you want to configure the labeler. Uh, and that, this is probably the longest name in the Firebase API. It's Firebase Vision on Device AutoML Image Labeler Options Builder. Yeah. So you, you sell one, you create a configuration. It's sort of like how the Camera X uh, image analyzer worked. Uh, you create an instance of this, uh, this labeler with these options. Uh, important, remember to call, call get on device because you don't want to send this to the cloud. And then you just call process image, add an on, add on success listener. And for each label, you can get the text uh, and the confidence. The text is basically what was it I detected here. And there's a bunch of more information in each of these labels, like where it was in the image, et cetera, et cetera. OK, I am almost ready. Uh, so let's talk about the conclusions on this. Camera X, it's still in alpha, but it is production ready, so you can start using it. Should just be aware of any API changes when you bump it up to once it's final. Uh, I think the latest version is alpha 5, so it should probably go into beta soon. Um, we got the Android Dev Summit coming up in about three weeks, I think, so you might expect something to happen there. Now, Today, camera X analysis, the callback, needs to be synchronous. You can't take the image that you get to that one and pass it on to another thread. That's the most important thing about the camera X analysis thing. Another thing is the viewfinder. The transforms for that one is really tricky. I wrote the blog post. Please read that one. But you can also feel free to steal like, that code snippet I had and play around with it. Maybe someone can come up with an even better version that is more generic. ML kit covers most of the use cases. It is easy to hear some, especially like people doing the other platform saying, I don't want to use Firebase because it adds a bunch of stuff to our app. But ML kit provides so much more simplicity to doing these operations. So I don't see any reasons why you shouldn't use it. Now, if it doesn't work for you, you should reach out to the Firebase team and talk to them about it. They're very receptive about feedback. So I really recommend you start with this one, regardless of what you do. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we have time for questions. We've got about seven minutes left. Uh, I don't know if we have a microphone for them if, or if there are any questions. I can't really see anyone. So. But otherwise, feel free to come down here. And uh, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>